Chapter 3 I found a little crowd of perhaps 20 people surrounding the huge hole in which the cylinder lay. The turf and gravel about it seemed charred, as if a sudden explosion had caused a flash of fire. Henderson and Ogilvy were not there. I think they had gone away to breakfast at Henderson's house. There were four or five boys sitting on the edge of the pit, with their feet dangling. They were amusing themselves, until I stopped them, by throwing stones at the giant mass. Among the bystanders were a couple of cyclists, a gardener I employed sometimes, and a girl carrying a baby. Greg the butcher and his little boy were also there, and two or three golf caddies who used to hang about the railway station. There was very little talking. Few of the common people in England had anything but the vaguest astronomical ideas in those days. Most of them were staring quietly at the big table-like end of the cylinder, which was still as Ogilvy and Henderson had left it. Some went away while I was there, and other people came. I clambered into the pit and fancied I heard a faint movement under my feet. The top had certainly ceased to rotate. It was only when I got close to it that the strangeness of this object was evident to me. At first glance, it was really no more exciting than an overturned carriage or a tree blown across the road. It required a certain amount of scientific education to understand how strange the cylinder was. Extraterrestrial had no meaning for most of the onlookers. It was quite clear in my own mind that the thing had come from the planet Mars. In spite of Ogilvy, I still believed that there were men in Mars, though I judged it improbable that the cylinder contained any living creature. I was impatient to see it open. What would we find inside? Manuscripts? Coins or models? About eleven, as nothing seemed to be happening, I walked back to my home in Maybury. But my mind was racing, and I found it difficult to get back to my work. The early editions of the evening newspapers had headlines that startled London. A message received from Mars. Remarkable story from Woking. Within hours, visitors began arriving at the common in large numbers. There were a half a dozen or more carriages from Woking station standing in the road by the sand pits. There was also quite a heap of bicycles. In addition, a large number of people must have walked, in spite of the heat of the day, from Woking and Chertsey. By mid-afternoon there was quite a considerable crowd, including one or two gaily dressed ladies. It was glaringly hot, not a cloud in the sky, nor a breath of wind. The only shadow was that of the few scattered pine trees. The burning heather had been extinguished, but the level ground towards Ottershaw was blackened as far as one could see, and still giving off vertical streamers of smoke. An enterprising sweetstuff dealer in the Chobham Road had sent up his son with a barrow load of green apples and ginger beer. Going to the edge of the pit, I found it occupied by a group of about a half a dozen men, Henderson, Ogilvy, and a tall, fair-haired man that I afterwards learned was Stent, the astronomer royal. There were also several workmen wielding spades and pickaxes. Stent was giving directions in a clear, high-pitched voice. He was standing on the cylinder, which was now evidently much cooler. His face was crimson and streaming with perspiration, and something seemed to have irritated him. A large portion of the cylinder had been uncovered, though its lower end was still embedded. As soon as Ogilvy saw me among the staring crowd on the edge of the pit, he called me to come down. The crowd is getting in our way, he said. Especially the boys. We want to put a light railing up to help to keep the people back. What have you found so far? Not much. We can hear some sounds from inside, but the workmen can't get the top off. The case is enormously thick 
and there's nothing to grip. As it was then about a quarter past five, I went home, had some tea, and tried to make sense of what had happened. Chapter 4 When I returned to the common, the sun was setting. Scattered groups were hurrying from the direction of Woking, and one or two persons were returning. The crowd about the pit had increased and stood out black against the lemon yellow of the sky. A couple of hundred people, perhaps. There were raised voices, and some sort of struggle appeared to be going on about the pit. As I drew nearer, I heard Stent's voice. Keep back! Keep back! A boy came running towards me. It's a moving, he said to me as he passed. A screwing, and a screwing out. I don't like it. I'm going home, I am. I went on to the crowd. There were really, I should think, two or three hundred people elbowing and jostling one another. He's fallen in the pit, cried someone. Keep back, said several. The crowd swayed a little, and I elbowed my way through. Everyone seemed greatly excited. I heard a peculiar humming sound from the pit. I say, said Ogilvy, help keep these idiots back. We don't know what's in the confounded thing, you know. I saw a young man, a shop assistant in Woking, I believe he was, standing on the cylinder and trying to scramble out of the hole again. The crowd had pushed him in. The end of the cylinder was being screwed out from within. Nearly two feet of shining screw projected. Somebody blundered against me and I narrowly missed being pitched on top of the screw. I turned and as I did so, the screw must have come out for the lid of the cylinder fell upon the gravel with a ringing sound. I stuck my elbow into the person behind me and turned my head towards the thing again. For a moment, that circular cavity seemed perfectly black. I had the sunset in my eyes. Everyone expected to see a man emerge. I know I did. But what I saw stirring within the shadow was like a little grey snake, about the thickness of a walking stick. The tentacle wriggled in the air towards me, followed by another. A sudden chill came over me. There was a loud shriek from a woman behind. I half turned, keeping my eyes fixed upon the cylinder from which other tentacles were now projecting. I began pushing my way from the edge of the pit. Astonishment was giving place to horror on the faces of the people about me. There was a general movement backwards. I saw the shopman struggling still on the edge of the pit. I found myself alone and saw the people on the other side of the pit running off, stent among them. I looked again at the cylinder and ungovernable terror gripped me. I stood petrified and staring. A big, greyish, rounded bulk, the size perhaps of a bear, was rising slowly and painfully out of the cylinder. As it caught the light, it glistened like wet leather. Two large, dark-coloured eyes were regarding me steadfastly. The head of the thing was rounded and had, one might say, a face. There was a mouth under the eyes the lipless brim of which quivered and panted and dropped saliva. The whole creature heaved and pulsated convulsively. Those who have never seen a living Martian can scarcely imagine the strange horror of its appearance. The peculiar V-shaped mouth with its pointed upper lip, the absence of a chin beneath the wedge-like lower lip, the incessant quivering of its mouth, the tentacles... I was struck, above all, by the extraordinary intensity of its immense eyes. They were at once vital, intense, inhuman, crippled and monstrous. There was something 
unspeakably nasty about this creature. Even at this first encounter, this first glimpse, I was overcome with disgust and dread. Suddenly, the monster vanished. It had toppled over the brim of the cylinder and fallen into the pit with a thud like the fall of a great mass of leather. I heard it give a peculiar thick cry. Then another of these creatures appeared from the deep shadow of the aperture. I turned and, running madly, made for the first group of trees, perhaps a hundred yards away. There, among some young pine trees and firs bushes, I stopped and, panting, waited further developments. The common round the sandpits was dotted with people standing like myself in a half-fascinated terror, staring at these creatures, or rather at the heaped gravel at the edge of the pit in which they lay. And then, with a renewed horror, I saw a round black object bobbing up and down on the edge of the pit. It was the head of the shopman who had fallen in, but showing as a little black object against the hot western sun. Now he got his shoulder and knee up, and again he seemed to slip back until only his head was visible. Suddenly he vanished, and I thought I heard a faint shriek. I had a momentary impulse to go back and help him, but my fears overruled. Everything was then hidden by the deep pit and the heap of sand that the fall of the cylinder had made. Anyone coming along the road from Cobham or Woking would have been amazed at the sight of perhaps a hundred people standing in a great irregular circle. They hid in ditches, behind bushes, behind gates and hedges, saying little to one another, and then in short, excited shouts. The barrow of ginger beer stood derelict, black against the burning sky. In the sandpits was a row of deserted carriages with their horses feeding out of nosebags or pouring the ground. <laughs>